Hawaii, where it still is today. Some of the information is based upon research derived from the information that I saw. For instance, in the documents that I saw, it was stated that President Eisenhower had commissioned a group called the Jason Scholars, which was stated to have been a secret society of scholars, to research the deception, lies, facts, truth, and get at the root and the real truth of the alien question. It also stated that there was a group of 12 men formed by NSC Memo 5410 and that the study group was formed by NSC Memo 5411 and that there was another NSC Memo issued to cover the actions of these men and explain the reasons why such prominent men were meeting on a regular basis and that NSC memo was 5412-1 and 5412-2. 5412-1 was implemented in March of 1955, 5412-2 in November of 1955. Anyone who knows how correspondence, executive orders, and executive memos are written knows that you do not write a memo 5412 in March, and then in November tack a second part onto it. The memo was originally really written in 1954. I'm going to go through the whole history. I'm going to have to leave a few things out simply because it's going to be impossible to cover everything in the hour and a half that I have. Before I begin, I would like to read two quotes to you. The first is attributed to Mr. Alistair Cook who said, quote, I'll be astounded if this planet is still going 50 years from now. I don't think we will reach 2,000. It would be miraculous, unquote. Winston Churchill said, and I quote, We seem to be moving, drifting, steadily against our will, against the will of every race and every people and every class toward some hideous catastrophe. Everyone wishes to stop it, but they do not know how. What do you think he was referring to? Ronald Reagan stated on October 18, 1983, in a meeting with Thomas Dine, who is the Executive Director of the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. And I quote Ronald Reagan, you know, I turn back to your ancient prophets in the Old Testament and the signs foretelling Armageddon, and I find myself wondering if, if we're the generation that is going to see that come about. I don't know if you've noted any of those prophecies lately, but believe me, they certainly describe the times we're going through. Now, ladies and gentlemen, during this talk that I'm going to give you, I'm going to explain to you the history of this phenomenon, who the secret government really is, and I will name them by name, beginning group, the study group. I will tell you who they are today. I'm going to tell you what this is all about. I'm going to tell you who's selling drugs to your children. And I'm going to tell you why the United States government is afraid for you to find out what the truth is regarding UFOs. <laughs> I'm going to skip over the early saucer recovers, recoveries, but there are many more than what you would expect. The early saucers Is this any better? There were many more saucer crashes and down craft than what you have realized. There were many more alien bodies recovered, and there were more live aliens recovered than what you are aware of. But that's not important. The important thing is, is that they occurred, not how many and not where. The important thing is that they occurred. And those of you who want to argue over how many and where and how many bodies are wasting the time of everyone else because that's not important. 
What's important is that they occurred. And there are two crashes that are so important that the government will go to any lengths to prevent you from finding out. And those are two crashes which occurred near the city of Aztec, New Mexico. Why? Because both of those crash craft contained human body parts. And they are deathly afraid of a national panic. Because of this, there was a very, very tight security blanket screwed down tight over all of the alien question, the down craft, the fact that they were here, the technology that we were recovering. Some crafts, strangely enough, were not damaged at all. But we could not recognize anything that we had previously known as mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, or any other thing that we knew of, except eventually we discovered that the craft contained a small reactor approximately the size of a large football or a small basketball, which was said to be a clean reactor, and the craft, this particular craft, used or seemed to use water as fuel. Now, how that all works, I don't know. I am not a nuclear physicist. Thank God. <clears throat> a special group of America's top scientists were organized under the name Project Sign in December of 1947 to study the phenomena. There was no such thing at that time as MJ-12. <clears throat> the whole nasty business was contained within the shroud of secrecy. Project Sign evolved into Project Grudge in December of 1948 a very low-level collection and disinformation project named Blue Book was formed under Grudge. Sixteen volumes were to come out of Grudge, including the controversial Grudge 13, which I and Bill English saw read and revealed to the public. Blue teams were put together to recover the crash disks and dead or alive aliens. The Blue teams were later to involve into Alpha teams under Project Pounce and Project Pluto. During these early years, the United States Air Force and the Central Intelligence Agency exercised complete control over the alien secret. The Air Force was later to be dropped because it was a young service and had no political power and could not overcome the power of the Army and the Navy. In fact, the CIA was formed by presidential executive order, first as the Central Intelligence Group, for the express purpose of dealing with the alien presence. Later, the National Security Act was passed, establishing it as the Central Intelligence Agency. The National Security Council was established to oversee the intelligence community and especially the alien endeavor. It was not created specifically to form national policy. In fact, you can say the National Security Council was the forerunner of MJ-12, and there was another group between MJ-12 and the National Security Council, which is to come later. A series of National Security Council memos and executive orders removed the CIA from the sole task of gathering foreign intelligence and slowly but thoroughly legalized direct action in the form of covert activities at home and abroad. On December 9, 1947, Truman approved issuance of NSC-4, entitled Coordination of Foreign Intelligence Information Measures, at the urging of Secretaries Marshall, Barstall, Patterson, and the Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff, Kennan, who, by the way, were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Foreign and Military Intelligence Book One, final report of the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, United States Senate, 94th Congress, Second Session, Report Number 94-755, April 26, 1976, page 49 states. This directive empowered the Secretary of State to coordinate overseas information activities designed to counter communism. A top secret annex to NSC-4, which was NSC-4 Alpha, or 4A, for those of you who are confused by military terms, instructed the Director of Central Intelligence to undertake covert psychological activities in pursuit of the aims set forth in NSC-4 and secretly 
was to run a psychological operation against the American public to hide the presence of UFOs and aliens. The initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under NSC-4A did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. How many of you understand what I just said to you? Not too many. Let me explain it. What this means, the initial authority given the CIA for covert operations under NSC-4 Alpha did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. That means they had to answer to no one. It means go do what you got to do. Don't bring any dirt back here, because we don't want to see it. Just get the job done. Don't ask anybody. Don't report to anybody. That's exactly what it means. It simply directed the DCI, which is the Director of Central Intelligence, to undertake covert actions and to ensure, through liaison with state and defense, that the resulting operations were consistent with American policy. The only guideline was that it was consistent with American policy. Later, NSC 10-1 and NSC 10-2 were to supersede NSC 4 and NSC 4A, and NSC 10-1 was to establish the Office of Policy Coordination, or the OPC, was chartered to carry out an expanded program of covert activities. It was directly responsible for the alien task projects. And it was the direct forerunner of MJ-12. NSC 10-1 and 10-2 validated illegal and extra-legal practices and procedures as being agreeable to the national security leadership. The reaction, of course, was very swift. In the eyes of the intelligence community, no holes were barred. Under NSC 10-1, an executive coordination group was established to review, but not approve, covert project proposals. Why? Because if you've ever read or known anything about President Truman, he was a mean little guy, and he didn't believe in trusting everybody else to do the right thing, and he kept the power solidly in his hands. He did not give it to anyone. The ECG was secretly tasked to coordinate the alien projects. NSC 10-1 and 2 were interpreted to mean that no one at the top wanted to know about anything until it was over and successful. These actions established a buffer between the President and the information, and it's important that you understand this because it's important later. It was intended that this buffer serve as a means for the President to deny knowledge if leaks divulged the true state of affairs. That is to prevent the collapse of the government. If the president can stand up and say, I didn't know about it, the government can survive. If the president cannot say that, then you have a very, very dangerous situation indeed. The buffer was used in later years for the purpose of effectively isolating succeeding presidents from any knowledge of the alien presence other than what the secret government and the intelligence community wanted them to know. NSC 10-2 established a study panel which met secretly and was made up of the scientific minds of the day and may very well have included some of those names which are on the fraudulent document known as Majestic 12 or the Eisenhower briefing document, which is in reality a contingency plan to lead you right through the Rose Garden. The study panel was not called MJ-12. In fact, the study panel was never called MJ-12. Another NSC memo, NSC 10-5, further outlined the duties of the study panel. These NSC memos and secret executive orders set the stage for the creation of MJ-12 only four years later. Now it gets nasty. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal began to object to the secrecy. He was a very idealistic and religious man who believed that the public should be told. When he began to talk to leaders of the opposition party and leaders of the Congress about the alien problem, he was asked, which is a polite way of saying you're fired, 
to resign by Truman. He expressed his fears to many people and rightfully believed that he was being watched and that his life was threatened. This was interpreted by those who were ignorant of the facts as paranoia, because most people had no knowledge of what was really going on. Forrestal later was said to have suffered a mental breakdown and was admitted, they say, actually, he was committed to Bethesda Naval Hospital against his will. In fact, it was feared that Forrestal would begin to talk again and he had to be isolated, discredited, and shut up. Sometime in the early morning of May 22, 1949, agents of the CIA tied a sheet around his neck, fastened the other end to a fixture in his room, and threw James Forrestal out the window. The sheet tore, and he plummeted to his death, and he became one of the first victims of the cover-up. The live alien that had been taken from the 1949 Roswell crash was called E.B. It was short for extraterrestrial biological entity, and all aliens are not called E.B. E.B. had a tendency to lie, and for over a year would give only the desired answers to questions asked. Those questions which would have resulted in an undesirable answer went unanswered. At some point during the second year of captivity, he began to open up, and the information derived from Evie was startling, to say the least. And this compilation of his revelations became the foundation of what would later be finished, called the Yellow Book. Photographs were taken of Evie, which, among others, I and Bill English were to view years later in Grudge 13. Why do they keep the aliens in a Faraday-shielded environment? Because they have a tendency to disappear right through walls. And if you can prevent the transmission of electromagnetic energy, you can stop them from doing it. In late 1951, E.B. became ill. Medical personnel had been unable to determine the cause of E.B.'s illness and had no background from which to draw. E.B.'s system was chlorophyll-based, and he processed food and energy much the same as plants. Waste material was excreted almost exactly the same as plants. It was decided that an expert in botany was called for. A botanist, Dr. Guillermo Mendoza, was brought in to try and help him recover. Those of you who have been looking for him on medical lists will not find him there. He was a Ph.D. in botany. Dr. Mendoza worked to save E.B. until mid-1952 when E.B. died. Dr. Mendoza eventually, according to the information that I read, became the expert on at least this type alien biology. In a futile attempt to save E.B. and to try and gain favor with this technological superior alien race, the United States began broadcasting a call for help early in 1952 into the vast regions of space. If you know they're better than you, and if you know they can lick you, you better try and be friends with them, and that's what this effort was all about. The call went unanswered, but the project continued as an effort of good faith. President Truman created the super-secret National Security Agency by secret executive order on November 4, 1952, and until recent years, there wasn't one in 50,000 people in the United States who even knew it existed. Its primary purpose was to decipher the alien communications and language and establish a dialogue with the, nation, with the aliens. This most urgent task was a continuation of the earlier effort and was codenamed SIGMA. The secondary purpose of the NSA was to monitor all communications and emissions from any and all devices worldwide for the purpose of gathering intelligence, both human and alien, and to contain the secret of the alien presence. Project Sigma, ladies and gentlemen, was extremely successful. The NSA also maintains communications with the Luna Base and other secret space programs. By executive order, the NSA is exempt from all laws which do not specifically name the NSA in the text of the law as being subject to that law. How many of you know what that means? That means we have a completely lawless organization running around the country doing whatever they want to do 
answering to no one, and under no law which does not name the National Security Agency in the text of that law as specifically being subject to that law by executive order of the President of the United States. That means that if the agency is not spelled out in the text of any and every law passed by the Congress, it is not subject to that or those laws. The NSA now performs many other duties and, in fact, is the premier agency within the intelligence community. Today, the NSA receives 75% of the monies allotted to the intelligence community. And the old sayings, ladies and gentlemen, where the money goes, therein the power resides, is absolutely true. The DCI today is mainly a figurehead. He is in charge of the CIA. The CIA does have many functions which are useful to this country and some which are deadly to us. The DCI, of course, is in charge of that agency. But he is not, as everyone thinks, the head of the intelligence community. That position really and truthfully lies with the director of the National Security Agency. The primary task of the NSA is still alien communications, but now includes other alien projects as well. President Truman had been keeping our allies, including the Soviet Union, informed of the developing alien problem since the Roswell recovery. This had been done in case the aliens turned out to be a threat to the human race and thus the world. Plans were formulated to defend the Earth in case of invasion. These were international plans which included most of the countries of the world. Great difficulty, however, was encountered in maintaining international secrecy. It was decided that an outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international efforts in order to hide the secret from the normal scrutiny of governments by the press. The result was the formation of a secret society which became known as the Bilderbergers. The headquarters of this group is in Geneva, Switzerland. The Bilderbergers evolved into a secret world government that now controls everything. The United Nations was then, and is now, an international joke. In 1953, a new president occupied the White House. He was a man used to a structured staff organization with a chain of command. His method was to delegate authority and rule by committee. He made major decisions, but only when his advisors were unable to come to consensus, and when he was in the Army, he was known as the diplomat. He was very good at what he did. He was very good at bringing people together, reaching consensus, and getting people to work for him. His normal method was to read through or listen to several alternatives and then approve one. Those who worked closely with him have stated that his favorite comment was, just do whatever it takes. Now here's a man very different from President Truman. He spent a lot of time on the golf course. This was not all, all unusual for a man who had been career army with the ultimate position of Supreme Allied Commander during the war, a post which carried five stars along with it. In fact, he deserved it. This president was General of the Army, Dwight David Eisenhower. During his first year in office, 1953, at least 10 more crash disks were recovered, along with 26 dead and four live aliens. One of the four live aliens died within hours of being removed from the craft. The others died approximately three or four days later. Of the 10, four were found in Arizona, two in Texas, one in New Mexico, one in Louisiana, one in Montana, and one in South Africa. There were hundreds of sightings. Why were so many craft crashing? Because the government was scared. And when they found out that the radar was downing the craft, they started aiming the radar at the craft with lock-on radar and pump the juice through. And they brought as many down as they could. Eisenhower knew that he had to wrestle and beat the alien problem. He knew that he could not do it by revealing the secret to the Congress because, in fact, isn't that the same as telling the public? Early in 1953, the new president turned to his friend and fellow member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Nelson Rockefeller, for help with the alien problem. 
Eisenhower and Rockefeller began planning the secret structure of alien task supervision, which was to become a reality within one year. The idea for MJ-12 was thus born. It was Nelson's uncle Winthrop Aldrich who had been crucial in convincing Eisenhower to even run for president. The whole Rockefeller family, and with them the Rockefeller empire, had solidly backed Eisenhower. Asking Rockefeller for help with the alien problem was to be the biggest mistake Eisenhower ever made for the future of the United States and most probably all of humanity, as you will soon see. What he literally did with this act, ladies and gentlemen, is abdicate the presidency to a secret group. Within one week of Eisenhower's election, he had appointed Nelson Rockefeller chairman of a presidential advisory committee on government organization. Rockefeller was responsible for planning the reorganization of the government. New Deal programs went into one single cabinet position called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. When the Congress approved the new cabinet position in April of 1953, Nelson was named to the post of undersecretary to Ovita Hulk Hobby. In 1953, also, astronomers discovered large objects in space which were moving toward the Earth, and it was first believed that they were asteroids. However, if you know much about astronomy, you know that you can predict or project or project backward orbital paths of bodies in space and determine where they come from, what they're doing, where they're going, and what their orbital path really is. Well, this failed to pan out, and the evidence proved that the objects could only be spaceships intelligently guided. Project Sigma intercepted alien communications, and when the objects reached the Earth, they took up a very high orbit around the equator. There were several huge ships, and their actual intent was unknown. Project Sigma and a new Project Plato through radio communications using the computer binary language, which the aliens understand very well, they're very mathematical minded, was able to arrange a landing that eventually resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. But in the meantime, something else happened. In the meantime, a race of human-looking aliens contacted the United States government. Where this happened, I do not know. I wish that I did. This alien group warned us against the aliens that were orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as the major condition. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle the technology which we then possessed, and has not that been true throughout our history. They believed that we would use any new technology to destroy each other as we always have. This race stated that we were on a path of self-destruction and we must stop killing each other, stop polluting the earth, stop raping the earth's natural resources, and learn to live in harmony with each other and with nature. These terms were met with extreme suspicion, especially the major condition of nuclear armament, disarmament, and I have to say that I could not blame them in the face of so many uncertainties and so many alien Surprises staring them directly in the face. It was believed that meeting that condition would leave us helpless in the face of an obvious alien threat. We also had nothing in history to help with the decision. Nuclear disarmament was not considered to be within the best interests of the United States, and the overtures were rejected. Later in 1954, the race of large-nosed gray aliens which had been orbiting the Earth landed at Holloman Air Force Base. It happened in 1954, ladies and gentlemen. If you take everything that Bob Immenegger has ever said and subtract 10 years from it, you will be right on the money. A basic agreement was reached. An alien named Krill was left as a pledge that they would return and formalize the agreement. In fact, he was a hostage. This race identified themselves as originating from a planet around a red star in the constellation of Orion, which we call Betelgeuse. I believe that that's a lie. 
They lie a lot, and they deceive a lot, and it is evident through every action that they've ever done with us. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, these creatures might be from Mars, really. They claim that they are from a planet which revolves around the red star, which we call Betelgeuse. They stated that their planet was dying and that at some unknown future time they would no longer be able to survive there. This led to a second landing at Edwards Air Force Base. The historical event had been planned in advance and details of the treaty had already been agreed upon. Eisenhower arranged to be in Palm Springs on vacation. On the appointed day, the president was spirited away to the base and the excuse was given to the press that he was visiting the dentist for a toothache. President Eisenhower met with the aliens and a formal treaty between the alien nation and the United States of America was signed. We then received our first alien ambassador from outer space, his name and title, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's absolutely true. His name and title was His Omnipotent Highness Krill, pronounced Krill, spelled K-R-L-L-L or C-R-L-L-L. In the American tradition of disdain for royal titles, he was secretly called Original Hostage Krill, or O-H Krill, so that Americans would not have to say, Your Omnipotent Highness. <clears throat> you should know that the alien flag is known as the trilateral insignia. It looks like a TP with two circles on either side of the V and one pole running straight down the middle. It is displayed on their craft and worn on their chest on their uniforms. Both of these landings in the second meeting were filmed, and the film exists today. Where it exists, I do not know, but I do know that it exists. The treaty stated, the aliens would not interfere in our affairs and we would not interfere in theirs. We were particularly interested that they do not interfere with anything that would affect our future which has been violated. We would keep their presence on Earth a secret. They would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us in our technological development. They would not make any treaty with any other Earth nation. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring of our development with the stipulation that the humans would not be harmed, would be returned to their point of abduction, that the humans would have no memory of the event, and that the alien nation would furnish MJ-12 with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regularly scheduled basis, and this is not being done. It was agreed that each nation would receive the ambassador of the other for as long as the treaty remained in force. It was further agreed that the alien nation in the United States would exchange 16 personnel each to the other with the purpose of learning each of the other. The alien guests would remain on Earth, and the human guests would travel to the alien point of origin for a specified period of time, then return, at which point a reverse exchange would be made. I have no knowledge whatsoever of what happened to those original 16 humans who left the Earth with the aliens. It was also agreed that bases would be constructed underground for the use of the alien nation, and that two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States government. The base at Dulce is one, the base at S-4 in the area known as Area 51 or Dreamland is the second. Exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. These alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the four corners of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and one would be constructed in Nevada in the area known as S-4, located approximately seven miles south of the western border of Area 51, otherwise known as Dreamland. All alien areas are under complete control of the Naval Department and all personnel who work in these complexes receive their checks from the Navy. Construction of the bases began immediately, but progress was slow until large amounts of money were made available in 1957, and in the meantime, work continued on the Yellow Book with the information derived from the guests. I would like to say at this time that the movie that most of you may have seen, how many of you saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind? That movie was absolutely true. Those events did take place. Not exactly as you saw them, 
not in the place where you saw them take place. But there was a landing, there was an agreement, there was conversation, there was an exchange of personnel made. I would like to say now also that J. Allen Hynek was the technical director on that movie, and he was also the co-author of Grudge 13, which I read between the years 1970 and 1973, along with another man named Lieutenant Colonel Friend. As you learned last night, it's the real nice guys that get you. Right, Phil? <clears throat> Project Red Light was formed, and experimentation and test flying alien craft was begun in earnest. As I told you earlier, many of the craft we recovered were intact, appeared to have no damage whatsoever. One craft actually exploded over the test site during testing sometime in the early 60s. I'm not sure what the exact date is, uh, but the explosion is said to have been seen over three states. Project Red Light, according to the information that I have, was postponed at that time because they had no idea what had happened or why the craft had exploded, but they lost the pilots, and the project went on hold. A super top secret facility was built at Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Dreamland. Until this area was built, testing was done at the Tonopah test range, and that's why some of you have conflicting information. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy and clearance of all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive, which means presidential or majestic approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. Many of you did not know that. The President of the United States cannot enter Area 51. There are very many other areas which he cannot enter also. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area known as S-4. Area S-4 was codenamed the Dark Side of the Moon. The Army was tasked to form a super-secret organization to furnish security for all alien task projects. This organization became the National Reconnaissance Organization based at Fort Carson, Colorado. The specific teams trained to secure the projects were called DELTA. A second project, codenamed Snowbird, was promulgated to explain away any sightings of the red light craft as being Air Force experiments. The Snowbird craft were manufactured using conventional technology and were flown for the press on several occasions. And those of you who are my age or older will remember, as children or young adults, going to the movie and seeing in the movie tone newsreel the Apro car and other strange looking saucer craft that were developed by the United States and the Canadian Armed Forces as a prod part of Project Snowbird. Project Snowbird was also used to debunk legitimate public sightings of alien craft, also called UFOs. Project Snowbird was very successful and reports from the public declined steadily until recent years. But not just due to Project Snowbird. There was an intense ridicule, denial, and debunking campaign going on since the beginning. People stopped reporting what they saw. A multi-million dollar secret fund was organized and kept by the military office of the White House. This fund was used to build over 75 deep underground facilities. Presidents who asked were told the fund was used to build deep underground shelters for the president in case of war. Only a few were built for the president. Millions of dollars were funneled through this office to MJ-12 and then out to the contractors and was used to build top secret alien bases as well as top secret dumb or deep underground military bases. I think dumb is very appropriate. And the facilities promulgated by Alternative 2 throughout the nation. President Johnson used this fund to build a movie theater and pave the road on his ranch and I believe he also used it to fix his shower. He had no idea of his true purpose but he felt that because it was military money, it was his money. 
The secret White House Underground Construction Fund was set up in 1957 by President Eisenhower. And you can forget Pruman because Eisenhower has done everything that's been done to us, not intentionally, not to hurt us, in the beginning to protect us. The funding was obtained from Congress under the guise of construction and maintenance of secret sites where the president could be taken in case of military attacks, called presidential emergency sites. The sites are literally holes in the ground deep enough to withstand a nuclear blast and are outfitted with state-of-the-art communications equipment. To date, there are more than 75 sites spread around the country that I can account for, which were built using money from this fund. The Atomic Energy Commission has built at least an additional 22 underground sites, again, that I can account for. The location and everything to do with these sites were and are considered and treated as top secret. The money was and is in control of the military office of the White House and was and is laundered through a circuitous web that even the most knowledgeable spy or accountant cannot follow. As of 1980, only a few at the beginning and end of this web knew what the money was for. At the beginning were Representative George Mahon of Texas, the Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and of its Defense Subcommittee, and Representative Robert Sykes of Florida, Chairman of the House Appropriations Military Construction Subcommittee. Today, it was rumored that House Speaker Jim Wright controlled the money in Congress and that a power struggle was underway to remove him. We all know what happened there, but I could not substantiate by any source the fact that he was in charge of the money. It is a rumor. At the end of the line were the President, MJ-12, the Director of the Military Office, and a commander at the Washington Navy Shipyard. The money was authorized by the Appropriations Committee, who allocated it to the Department of Defense as a top-secret item in the Army Construction Program. The Army, however, ladies and gentlemen, could not spend it, and, in fact, did not even know what it was for. Authorization to spend the money was, in reality, given to the Navy. You'll find out why the Navy has control of all this a little bit later. It'll become clear to you. The money was channeled to the Chesapeake Division of the Navy Engineers, who did not know what it was for either. Not even the commanding officer, who was an admiral, knew what the fund was to be used for. Only one man, a Navy commander, who was assigned to the Chesapeake Division, but in reality was responsible only to the military office of the White House, knew of the actual purpose, amount, and ultimate destination of the top secret fund. The total secrecy surrounding the fund that meant that almost every trace of it could be made to disappear by the very few people who controlled it. There has never been, and most probably never will, be an audit of this secret money. Large amounts of this money were transferred from the top secret fund to a location at Palm Beach, Florida that belongs to the Coast Guard called Peanut Island. The island is adjacent to property which was owned by Joseph Kennedy. The money was said to have been used for landscaping and general beautification. The money did not begin to be transferred to Peanut Island until shortly after Kennedy's assassination. Some time ago, a TV news special on the Kennedy assassination told of a Coast Guard officer transferring money in a briefcase to a Kennedy employee across this property line. It was on television. Could this have been a secret payment to the Kennedy family for the loss of their son, John F. Kennedy? I think it was, but I can't prove it. The payments continued through the year 1967 and then stopped. The total amount transferred is unknown and the actual use of the money is unknown. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Nelson Rockefeller changed positions again. He had been in sort of a holding position until the time was right, and now the time was right. This time he was to take C.D. Jackson's old position, which had been called the Special Assistant for Psychological Strategy. With Nelson's appointment, the name was changed to the Special Assistant for Cold War Strategy. This position would evolve over the years into the same position Henry Kissinger was ultimately to hold under President Nixon. Officially, he was to give advice and assistance in the development of increased understanding and cooperation among all peoples. Sounds very nice and innocent, doesn't it? The official description, of course, was a smokescreen. For secretly, he was the presidential coordinator for the intelligence community. 
In his new post, Rockefeller reported directly and only to the President. He attended meetings of the Cabinet, the Council on Foreign Economic Policy, and the National Security Council, which was the highest policy-making body in the government. Nelson Rockefeller was also given a second important job as the head of the secret unit called the Planning Coordination Group, which was formed under NSC 5412-1 in March of 1955. However, the memo was written in 1954 at the same time that NSC 10 and, or excuse me, NSC 5410 and NSC 5411 were written. It was not used until it was needed. The group consisted of different ad hoc members depending upon the subject on the agenda. The basic members were Rockefeller, a representative of the Department of Defense, a representative of the Department of State, and the Director of Central Intelligence. It was soon called the 5412 Committee or the Special Group. NSC 5412-1 established the rule for the first time, established the rule that covert operations were subject to approval by... By secret executive memorandum, NSC 5410, Eisenhower had preceded NSC 5412-1 in 1954 to establish a permanent committee, not ad hoc, to be known as Majority 12, MJ-12, to oversee and conduct all covert activities concerned with the alien question. NSC 5412-1 was created to explain the purpose of these meetings when Congress and the press became curious as to why such important and prominent men were meeting on a regular basis. Majority 12 was made up of Nelson Rockefeller, the Director of Central Intelligence, Alan Welsh Dulles, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of Defense, Charles E. Wilson, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Arthur W. Radford, and that's why the Navy got everything, because the first joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who served on MJ-12 was Navy. If it had been an Army general, the Army would have had it. The director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, and that should answer a lot of questions for you, and six men from the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations known as the Wise Men. These men were all members of a secret society of scholars that called themselves the Jason Society. I see you smiling, Phil. Thought I didn't know it, didn't I? <coughs> Fool you. Are the Jason scholars who recruited their members from the Skull and Bones and the Scroll and Key societies of Harvard and Yale? And that was stated verbatim in Operation Majority. The wise men were key members of the Council on Foreign Relations. There were 12 members, including the first six from government positions, thus majority 12. This group was made up over the years of the top officers and directors of the Council on Foreign Relations and later the Trilateral Commission. Gordon Dean, George Bush, and Zbigniew Brzezinski were among them. The most important, however, and influential of the wise men who served on MJ-12 were John McCloy, Robert Lovett, Averill Harriman, Charles Bolin, George Kennan, and Dean Acheson. Their policies were to last well into the decade of the 70s, and it is significant that President Eisenhower, as well as the first six MJ-12 members from the government, were also members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Thorough researchers will soon discover that not all of the wise men attended Harvard or Yale and not all of them were chosen for Skull and Bones or Scroll and Key membership during their college years. You will be able to quickly clear up this mystery by obtaining the book The Wise Men by Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas, Simon & Schuster, New York. And under illustration number nine in the center of the book, you will find the caption, Love it with the Yale unit above far right and on the beach. His initiation into Skull and Bones came at an airbase near Dunkirk. I have found that members were chosen on an ongoing basis by invitation based upon merit post-college and was not confined to over only Harvard or Yale attendees. 
It also had something to do with how, how much money your family had, unless you were a military officer. A chosen few were later initiated into the Jason Society. They are all members of the Council on Foreign Relations and at that time were known as the Eastern Establishment. This should give you a clue to the far-reaching and serious nature of these most secret college societies. The Jason Society is alive and well today, but now includes members of the Trilateral Commission as well. The Trilateralists existed secretly several years before 1973 because I saw the name of the Trilateral Commission in the documents in 1971. The name of the Trilateral Commission was taken from the alien flag known as the Trilateral Insignia. And that should give you some clue as to how much trouble you're in. Majority 12 was to survive right up to the present day. Under Eisenhower and Kennedy, it was erroneously called the 5412 Committee, or more correctly, the Special Group. In the Johnson administration, it became the 303 Committee, named after the room that they met in at the White House when they met at the White House. Because the name 5412 had been compromised in the book The Secret Government, Actually, it was not compromised. It was intentionally leaked to explain the purpose of the meeting of these men so that no one would go looking for NSC 5410 and NSC 5411. And I wish you all luck. I hope that you're able to dig it out. Actually, NSC 5412-1 was leaked to the author to hide the existence of NSC 5410. Under Nixon, Ford, and Carter, it was called the 40 Committee, and under Reagan, it became the PI 40 Committee. But over all those years, only the name changed. The positions remained the same. By 1955, it became obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. Mutilated humans, yes, mutilated humans, were being found along with mutilated animals, and yes, mutilated animals, and those of you who doubt that this is taking place, should leave your job, should leave your home, should do whatever you have to do, and go look for yourself. Because it's important that you know it and that you believe it. These things were being found all across the United States. It was suspected that the aliens were not submitting a complete list of human contacts and abductees to MJ-12, and it was suspected that not all abductees had been returned, and this has been verified. The Soviet Union was suspected of interacting with them, and this proved also to be true. It was learned that the aliens had been and were then manipulating masses of people through secret societies, witchcraft, magic, the occult, and religion. After several Air Force combat air engagements with alien craft, it also became apparent that our weapons were no match against theirs. In November of 1955, NSC 5412-2 was issued, establishing a study committee to explore all factors which are involved in the making and implementing of foreign policy in the nuclear age. This, again, was only a blanket of snow that covered the real subject of study, which was the alien question. For, in fact, 5412-2 had, as I told you earlier, been written in 1954, when NSC 5410 and 5411 was written, and 5411, by secret executive memorandum, in 1954, the study group was commissioned to examine all the facts, evidence, lies, and deception and discover the truth of the alien question. NSC 54-2 was only a cover that had become necessary when the press began inquiring as to the purpose of regular meetings of such important men. When the press asked Gordon Dean somewhere near the end of 1954 why they were meeting and what they were studying, Gordon Dean says, as of yet, we have no direction. But we're working on it. It then became necessary to find a direction and find a reason for these meetings, and that's exactly what they did. The first meetings began in 1954 and were called the Quantico meetings because they met at the Quantico Marine Base. See, one thing I knew, ladies and gentlemen, I know who they are. I know what they were called. All I had to do was find out who belonged to those names. 
and it's impossible to hold meetings of 36 prominent men secret over such a long period of time. The study actually lasted three years, not forever. It was a three-year study, period. A study group was made up of 35 members of the Council on Foreign Relations secret scholars known as the Jason Society or the Jason Scholars. Dr. Edward Teller was invited to participate. Dr. Zabignew, Brzezinski was the study director for the first 18 months. Dr. Henry Kissinger was chosen as the group study director for the second 18 months beginning in November of 1955. Nelson Rockefeller was a frequent visitor during the study. I'm going to read you the study group members now. For those of you who know who these people are, you're going to be amazed. Those of you who do not, I advise that you purchase a copy of my text, which will be on sale the minute that I finish my last word. <coughs> and research everything that I'm telling you, and your own research will tell you that I am telling you the truth, and I don't have to do that. You see, I'm a witness. I'm not a ufologist, and I'm not by profession a researcher. I'm doing this because I want the Constitution put back where it belongs. <laughs> the study group members were Gordon Dean, chairman, one of the most powerful men in the United States at that time. Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, study director for the first phase. Dr. Henry Kissinger, study director for the second phase. Dr. Edward Teller represented the scientific community. Major General Richard C. Lindsay, Hanson W. Baldwin, Lloyd B. Berkner, Frank C. Nash, Paul H. Nitze, Charles P. Noyes, Frank Pace, Jr., James A. Perkins, Don K. Price, David Rockefeller, Oscar M. Rubhausen, Lieutenant General James M. Gavin, Carl P. Haskins, James T. Hill, Jr., Joseph E. Johnson, Mervyn J. Kelly, Frank Altshul, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, Major General James McCormick, Jr., Robert R. Bowie, McGeorge Bundy, William A. M. Burden, John C. Campbell, Thomas K. Finletter, George S. Franklin, Jr., I. I. Rabbi, Roswell L. Gilpatrick, N. E. Hallaby, General Walter Bedell Smith, called Beetle, Henry DeWolf Smythe, Shields Warren, Carol L. Wilson, and Arnold Wolfers. Now, these aren't bad guys. They were a study group. And the first MJ-12 was not made up of bad guys. They were made up of concerned Americans. What happened later became bad. The yanking of power away from the president the formation of a secret government, the sale of drugs to the American people, etc., 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 and I'm going to cover most of those things before I'm finished. It's about time. The second phase meetings were also held at the Marine Base at Quantico, Virginia, and the group became known as Quantico II. Nelson Rockefeller built a retreat somewhere in Maryland, which could only be reached by air for MJ-12 for MJ and the study committee, so that they could meet away from public scrutiny. He donated the land, he built the facilities. Say hello for me, Phil. <laughs> so that they could meet away from public scrutiny. The secret meeting place is known by the code name, the Country Club. Complete living, eating, recreation, library, and meeting facilities exist at the location. The study group was publicly closed in the later months of 1956, and Henry Kissinger published what was officially termed the results in 1957 as Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy by Henry A. Kissinger, published for the Council on Foreign Relations by Harper and Brothers, New York. 
In truth, the manuscript had already been 80% written while Kissinger was at Harvard. The study group continued veiled in secrecy. A clue to the seriousness Kissinger attached to the study can be found in statements by his wife and friends. Many of them stated that Henry would leave home early each morning and return late each night without speaking to anyone or responding to anyone. It seemed, in fact, as if he were in another world which held no room for anyone else. Now, when they say that he would not speak to anyone or respond to anyone, they meant it literally. I find these statements very revealing. The revelations of the alien presence and actions during the study must have been a great shock. I know I would have been shocked. Henry Kissinger was definitely out of character during the time surrounding these meetings, as he is normally described as being a gentleman, very charming, and most people who meet him like him very much. Henry Kissinger would never again be affected in this manner, no matter the seriousness of any subsequent event. On many occasions, he would work very late into the night after having already put in a full day, Coupled with his not speaking, this behavior eventually led to his divorce. A major finding of the alien study was that the public could not be told, as it was believed that this would most certainly lead to economic collapse, collapse of the religious structure, and national panic, which would lead into anarchy. Secrecy thus continued. An offshoot of this finding was that if the public could not be told, then the Congress could not be told. Thus, funding for the projects and research would have to come from outside the government. There are some things beginning to fall into place. Without aliens, you cannot make sense of anything else that's been happening for the 44 years. You put the aliens in the middle of this stuff and you've got all the answers, every one of them. In the meantime, money was to be obtained from the military budget and from CIA confidential non-appropriated funds. Another major finding was the aliens were using humans and animals for a source of glandular secretions, enzymes, hormonal secretions, blood, and in horrible genetic experiments. The aliens explained these actions as necessary to their survival. What I'm going to tell you now is very sad if it's true because I am unable to weed through the lies and deception and really find the truth. All I know is what they told us. They stated that their genetic structure had deteriorated and that they were no longer able to reproduce. They stated that if they were unable to improve their genetic structure, their race would soon cease to exist. We looked upon their explanations with extreme suspicion. Since our weapons were literally useless against the aliens, MJ-12 decided to continue friendly diplomatic relations with them until such time as we were able to develop a technology which would then enable us to challenge them on a military basis. Overtures would have to be made to the Soviet Union and other nations to join forces for the survival of humanity. In the meantime, plans were developed to research and construct two weapon systems using conventional and nuclear technology, which would hopefully bring us to parity. The results of the research were Projects Joshua and Excalibur. Joshua was a weapon captured from the Germans, which at that time was capable of shattering four-inch thick armor plate at a range of two miles using low-frequency aimed sound waves. And it was believed that this weapon would be effective against the alien craft and beam weapons. Excalibur was a weapon carried by missiles not to exceed 30,000 feet above ground level, not to deviate from designated target more than 50 meters, that would penetrate 1,000 meters of tufa hard-packed soil such as that found in New Mexico, would carry a one megaton warhead, and was intended for use in destroying the aliens in their underground bases. Joshua was developed successfully but never used to my knowledge. Excalibur was not pushed until recent years, and now there is an unprecedented effort to develop this weapon. The people who are working on these weapons tell us that they have never been pushed so hard in their history working on any project than they are being pushed to develop Project Excalibur. Now, what I'm going to read you next may upset some of you, but it's absolutely true. 
The events at Fatima in the early part of the century were scrutinized. On suspicion that it was alien manipulation, an intelligence operation was put into motion to penetrate the secrecy surrounding the event. The United States utilized its Vatican moles that had been recruited and nurtured during World War II and soon obtained the entire Vatican study, which included the prophecy. And I don't care what you've ever read before, you have not read the true prophecy. This prophecy stated that if man did not turn from evil and place himself at the feet of Christ, the planet would self-destruct and the events described in the book of Revelations would indeed come to pass. It stated that a child would be born who would unite the world with a plan for world peace and a false religion beginning in 1992. By 1995, the people would discern that he was evil and was indeed the Antichrist. World War III would begin in the Middle East in 1995 with an invasion of Israel by a United Arab Nation using conventional weapons which would culminate in a nuclear holocaust in the year 1999. Between 1999 and 2003, most of the life on this planet would suffer horribly and die as a result. The return of Christ would occur in the year 2011. Is this true? I don't know. I know that it was decided by the United States government that this was indeed an alien event, and I believe that this is more deception which is being heaped upon us. So don't go out of here thinking that the world is going to end tomorrow because of this. It might be because of something else, and I'm going to talk about that, but not because of this. When the aliens were confronted with this finding, they confirmed that it was true. The aliens explained that they had created us through hybridization and had manipulated the human race through religion, Satanism, witchcraft, magic, the occult, secret societies, etc. They further explained that they were capable of time travel and the events would indeed come to pass. Later exploitation of alien technology by the United States and the Soviet Union utilizing time travel confirmed that indeed something bad was going to happen. The aliens showed a hologram which they claimed was the actual crucifixion of Christ, which the government filmed. We did not know whether to believe them or not. Were they using our genuine religions to manipulate us? Or were they indeed the source of our religions, with which they had been manipulating us all along? Or was this the beginning scenario of the genuine end times and the return of Christ, which had been predicted in the Bible? No one knew the answer, and I don't know the answer either. A symposium was held in 1957, which was attended by some of the great scientific minds then living. It was held in Huntsville, Alabama. They reached the conclusion that by or shortly after the year 2000, the planet would self-destruct due to increased population and man's exploitation of the environment without any help from God or the aliens. By secret executive order of President Eisenhower, the Jason Scholars were ordered to study this scenario and make recommendations from their findings. This was done. The Jason Society confirmed the finding of the scientists and made three recommendations called Alternatives 1, 2, and 3. Alternative 1 was to use nuclear devices to blast holes in the stratosphere from which the heat and pollution could escape into space. I'll buy heat, but I'll never buy pollution. Change the human cultures from that of exploitation into cultures of environmental protection. Of the three, this was decided to be the least likely to succeed due to the inherent nature of man and the additional damage the nuclear explosions would themselves create. Alternative two was to build a vast network of underground cities and tunnels in which a select representation of all cultures and occupations would survive and carry on the human race. The rest of humanity would be left to fend for themselves on the surface of the planet. Alternative three was to exploit the alien and conventional technology in order for a select few to leave the Earth and establish colonies in outer space. I am not able to either confirm or deny the existence of batch consignments of human slaves which would be used for the manual labor in the effort as a part of the plan. The moon, codenamed Adam, would be the object of primary interest, followed by the planet Mars, codenamed Eve. As a delaying action, all three alternatives included birth control, sterilization, forced if necessary, 
and the introduction of deadly microbes to control or slow the growth of the Earth's population. AIDS is only one result of these plans. There are others. It was decided, since the population must be reduced and controlled, that it would be in the best interest of the human race to rid ourselves of the undesirable elements of our society. The joint U.S. and Soviet leadership dismissed Alternative 1, but ordered work to begin on Alternative 2 and 3 virtually at the same time. Those of you in the state of Washington who report hearing machinery underground are probably correct. In 1959, the Rand Corporation hosted a deep underground construction symposium. I have a copy of this symposium report, which I'm not supposed to have. Nevertheless, I have it, approximately this thick. In the symposium report, machines are pictured and described which could bore a tunnel 45 feet in diameter at the rate of 5 feet per hour in 1959. Just think what they can do now. It also displays pictures of huge tunnels and underground vaults containing what appear to be complex facilities and possibly even cities. It appears that the previous five years of all-out underground construction had made very significant progress by that time. The ruling powers decided that one means of funding the Alien Connected and other black projects was to corner the illegal drug market. A young, ambitious member of the Council on Foreign Relations was approached. His name is George Bush, who at the time was the president and CEO of Zapata Oil based in Texas. Zapata Oil was experimenting with the new technology of offshore drilling. It was correctly thought that the drugs could be shipped from South America to the offshore platforms by fishing boat where it would then be taken to shore by the normal transportation used for supplies and personnel. By this method, no customs or law enforcement agency would subject the cargo to search. George Bush agreed to help and organize the operation in conjunction with the CIA. The plan worked better than anyone had thought and has since expanded worldwide, and there are now many other methods of bringing the illegal drugs into the country. But it must always be remembered that George Bush began the sale of drugs to our children. Now, if you think I'm crazy, get off your butt and start digging, because you will find out that it's absolutely true. The CIA now controls all the world's illegal drug markets. The official space program was boosted by President Kennedy in his inaugural address when he mandated that the United States put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Although innocent in its conception, this mandate enabled those in charge to funnel vast amounts of money into black projects and conceal the real space program from the American people. A similar program in the Soviet Union served the same purpose. In fact, a joint alien United States and Soviet Union base already existed on the moon at the very moment Kennedy spoke the words. On May 22, 1962, a space probe landed on Mars and confirmed the existence of an environment which could support life. Not long afterward, the construction of a colony on the planet Mars began in earnest. Today, there is a colony which exists on the planet Mars. It is a United States-Russian alien facility. If you believe it's outrageous, stick around a few years. This is very disturbing information, and I don't expect anyone to believe it. I don't expect one of you to believe what I'm telling you. And I knew that when I came here. I'm not one of you. I'm not a ufologist. I'm not a researcher. I have an obligation to inform the public, and once that's done, I've done my job. From then on, it's up to you, not me. <laughs> This colony exists on Mars, populated by specially select people from different cultures and occupations taken from all over the Earth. 
A public charade of antagonism between the Soviet Union and the United States has been maintained over all these years in order to fund projects in the name of national defense when in fact we are the closest allies. At some point, President Kennedy discovered portions of the truth concerning the drugs and the aliens. He issued an ultimatum in 1963 to MJ-12. President Kennedy assured them that if they did not clean up the drug problem, he would. He informed MJ-12 that he intended to reveal the presence of aliens to the American people within the following year and ordered a plan developed to implement his decision. President Kennedy was not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and knew nothing of Alternative 2 or Alternative 3 that I can find out. Internationally, the operations were supervised by an executive committee known as the Policy Committee. In the United States, they were supervised by MJ-12 and in the Soviet Union by a sister organization. President Kennedy's decision, of course, struck fear into these people. His assassination was ordered by the Policy Committee, and the order was carried out by agents of MJ-12 in Dallas. President John F. Kennedy was murdered by the Secret Service agent who drove his car in the motorcade, and the act is plainly visible in the film. It was stated in the documents that I saw. The assassin's name is William Greer. Watch the driver and not Kennedy when you view the film, when you can find a film that even shows it. All of the witnesses who were close enough to the car to see William Greer shoot Kennedy were themselves all murdered within two years of the event. That's fact. The Warren Commission was a farce and Council on Foreign Relations members made up the majority of its panel. They succeeded in snowing the American people and they hid the truth. And many other patriots who have attempted to reveal the alien secret have also been murdered throughout the intervening years. And that is why I've been so careful about the information that I released, because it was so important that I get here today to be able to tell you the truth, and what happens after me, after today, is of no consequence whatsoever. But what you do is. During the era of the United States' initial space exploration and the moon landings, every launch was accompanied by alien craft. A moon base dubbed Luna was sighted and filmed by the Apollo astronauts. Domes, spires, tall round structures which look like silos, huge T-shaped mining vehicles which left stitch-like tracks in the lunar surface, and extremely large as well as small alien craft appear in the photographs. It is, in fact, a joint United States, Russian, and alien base. The space program is a farce and an unbelievable waste of money. Alternative 3 is a reality, and it is not at all science fiction. Most of the Apollo astronauts were severely shaken by this experience and their lives and subsequent statements reflect the depths of the revelation and the effect of the muzzle order which followed. They were ordered to remain silent or suffer the extreme penalty, death, which was termed an expediency. One astronaut actually did talk to the British producers of the TV expose Alternative 3 confirming many of the allegations, however I do not know who it was. In the book, Alternative 3, the pseudonym Bob Groden was used in place of the astronaut's identity. It was also stated that he committed suicide in 1978. This cannot be validated by any source, and I believe that several so-called facts in the book are really disinformation. However, I can assure you that Alternative 3 is real. I firmly believe that this disinformation is a result of pressure put upon the authors and is meant to nullify the effect upon the populace of the British TV expose entitled Alternative 3. The headquarters of the international conspiracy is in Geneva, Switzerland. The ruling body is made up of representatives of the governments involved as well as the executive members of the group known as the Bilderbergers. Meetings are held by the policy committee when necessary on a nuclear submarine beneath the polar ice cap. The secrecy is such that this was the only method which could ensure that the meetings could not be bugged and is the only place where they discuss their most secret matters. I can say that the book is at least 70% true from my own knowledge and the knowledge of my sources. I believe that the disinformation was an attempt to compromise the British TV expose with information which could be proven false, just as the Eisenhower briefing document was released here in the United States under the contingency plan Majestic 12, and which can also be proven false. 
Since our interaction with the aliens began, we have come into possession of technology beyond our wildest dreams. A craft named Aurora exists at Area 51, which makes regular trips into space. It is a one-stage ship called a TAV, or trans-atmospheric vehicle. And it can take off from the ground using a seven-mile runway, go into high orbit, return on its own power, and land on the same runway. We currently have and fly atomic-powered alien craft at Area S4 in Nevada. Our pilots have made interplanetary voyages in these craft and have been to the moon, Mars, and other planets aboard these craft. There is a group of pilots at the base who wear a patch, which has a little alien peeking over the bottom. It has, I think, three or four letters at the top. I forget what they are, but John Lear knows what they are. There is a picture of Saturn and a picture of Mars in the photograph. And in the background, there are seven stars, which are strangely shaped just like the stars in the Pleiades group. What that means, I don't know. We have been lied to about the true nature of the moon, the planets Mars and Venus, and the real state of technology that we possess today at this very moment. There are areas in the moon where plant life grows and even changes color with the seasons. And this seasonal effect is because the moon does not, as claimed, always present the exact same side to the earth or the sun. There is an area that wobbles in and out of darkness on a seasonal basis, and it is near this area that the plant life grows. The moon does have a few man-made lakes and ponds upon its surface, and clouds have been observed and filmed in its atmosphere. How many of you remember the period of time, several years, when almost every reported alien craft that was reported landed was on or near water and appeared to be pumping water into the craft? How many of you remember that? Quite a few. The water went to the moon, ladies and gentlemen, to change the moon. And it is working. It possesses a gravitational field and man can walk upon its surface without a spacesuit breathing from an oxygen bottle after undergoing decompression the same as any deep sea diver. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can come from 1,200 feet underwater to the surface through decompression, you can go from the surface to one atmosphere of vacuum. See, vacuum does not cause a problem for the human body. It's the inert gas that's dissolved in your tissues and in your bones and in the fluids in your body that causes you the problem. If this is decompressed properly, you will have no problem. All you need is a very small amount of oxygen, very small pressure to breathe. You will suffer no harm except for one thing, that oxygen becomes toxic after breathing it over a long period of time. Therefore, excursions would have to be of a minimal time length. Other than that, there is no reason why you or anyone else cannot walk on the surface of the moon or in space in a vacuum without a spacesuit. How do I know? I used to be one of the world's experts on deep sea mixed gas breathing mixtures for divers and on deep saturation diving. When I was the head of the department of the Mixed Gas Deep Saturation Diving Division of the College of Oceaneering. And I can tell you now, it's much easier to decompress to a vacuum and walk on the surface of the moon than it is to bring a man up from 600 feet. I have seen the photographs, and some of them were actually published in a book called We Discovered Alien Bases on the Moon by Fred Steckling. However, all the photographs are not there, but there are some very good ones. I would advise you to buy the book. I would advise you to look at the photographs, get the NASA number, and send for them. I doubt that you can still get them, but at one time you could. In 1969, a confrontation broke out between the human scientists and the aliens at the Dulce Underground Lab. The aliens took many of our scientists hostage. Delta forces were sent in to free them, but were no match against the alien weapons. Sixty-six of our people were killed during this action. As a result, we withdrew from all joint projects for at least two years. A reconciliation eventually took place, and once again we began to interact. As far as I know, today we are interacting with the aliens. Now.
I'm gone past my limit. Uh, I'm not going to infringe upon the other speakers. The text of my speech will be on sale outside. I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. What happens to me is of no consequence, and I knew that when I started this. And over the last 17 years, I knew that someday I was going to have to get up and say this, whether I wanted to or not, whether I was afraid or not. Now I am here, and now it is done. And I feel an overwhelming relief. You now have the information. You can laugh at it. You can throw it in the trash can. You can burn my house down if you want to. But I am telling you right now, your future, your children's future, your grandchildren's future, depends upon what you do with this information. Your own government is selling your children drugs. And you don't seem to care. Your own government has given away the power of the people, and you don't seem to care. There is an apathy that is running rampant in this country that is deadly. Whether or not there are aliens. We are truly now at this moment a nation of sheep. And ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that sheep are always led to the slaughter. But it does not have to be that way. There is tremendous power in knowledge. There is also tremendous power in secrecy. Take away that secrecy, you make sure that you're informed, and you can change things. And stop fighting with each other. Thank you. This time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think a five minute break is in order. What do you think, Joe? It's been a long time. Please keep it to five minutes because we really are very limited on time.